All right, welcome back. In this segment, we're going to continue with the theme about the Mexican history um, with the Catholic Church in Mexico that occurred about a hundred years ago. In this segment, we're going to uh, go over the Cristeros. Uh, this is a Catholic a group that rose up to defend religious freedom in Mexico. Uh, the first Cristero War was fought in Mexico between 1926 and 1929. This segment is to make you aware of a religious persecution, a brutal persecution that occurred in Mexico just about a hundred years ago. This is very little known history and we would like to share this important history with you in this segment. The Mexican government under President Calles, and here's a picture of the brutal dictator of Mexico at that time, sought to exterminate the Catholic Church from Mexico by enacting an anti-Catholic constitution in 1917. After attempting to peacefully protest the government shutdown of the Catholic Church in Mexico, the people, as a last, last, last resort, were forced to take up arms to defend their culture, their tradition, and their Catholic identity. The Cristeros consisted mainly of poor Indian people. Um, here's a picture of how the Cristeros looked, okay? Uh, they kind of look like cow they look like cowboys of the Cristeros. Here's some more pictures of the Cristeros here. And then here's a picture of some Cristero members of the Cristero army that rose up. But they always had a picture or a banner of our Lord or Our Lady of Guadalupe. And then also you can see up here, Viva Cristo Rey, which was their battle cry, which means long live Christ the King in Spanish. So Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. These freedom fighters were called Cristeros. Um, at first, they got the name from the federal government, the anti-Catholic government. They kind of used that as like kind of a mockery, but this became their, their name and what they, what they were known as. Uh, the second war for religious liberty in Mexico occurred from 1935 to 1940, which is known as the Second La Cristiada, or the Second Cristero War, which I'm going to touch base with on another segment. So stay tuned for that one. Um, I will share those details with you, so stay tuned for that. Um, shortly after President Calles and the anti-Catholic government, which was a fascist government, it wasn't communist, it was a Masonic fascist government. Uh, they expelled all foreign clergy out of Mexico, resulting in a severe shortage of priests in Mexico. By 1929, at least 90 priests were executed. Here's a picture of an execution, and this uh, priest is featured in the movie For Greater Glory. I strongly encourage you to watch the movie For Greater Glory. This poor priest by the name of Father Francisco Vera was put before a firing squad. There's a picture that was taken given to President Calles, and he actually put this in newspapers to discourage, to, to discourage the faithful Catholics in Mexico and, to, and frighten the, the, the uh, Catholic priests. But he was executed for simply wearing his priestly garb and celebrating Mass. If priests were found celebrating Mass or admitting, administering sacraments, uh, they could be executed on the spot without a trial, which occurred in this case right here. I will also touch base in another segment about St. Terribio Romo, who was another Catholic priest that was mercilessly and brutally executed for simply be being a Catholic priest. The 1917 Mexican Constitution forbade Catholic priests and nuns from wearing any religious clothing in public. I also want to show you, here's another picture of the Cristeros right here. So here's how they looked. Uh, primarily, 
Indian Catholics who converted to Catholicism when the Virgin Mary in 1531 appeared to an Aztec Indian by the name of uh, Juan Diego, who is now a saint, Saint Juan Diego. And notice that she appeared as an Indian Aztec woman. And you can see right here, she's clothed in the sun. She has the moon under her feet, who, which shows superiority over the Aztec sun and moon god. So this created a miraculous conversion in Mexico with millions of the Indians, the indigent uh, Indians that lived there to convert to Catholicism. They had such a strong faith and still do today as a result of this miracle. Here's another photo. Here's how brutal uh, President Calles and the anti-Catholic government of Mexico was. Uh, they would execute Catholics and hang them on telephone poles to frighten the faithful. And while they were riding, while they were riding in trains, uh, you could see these poor Catholics that were hung on the on, uh, on telephone poles in Mexico. And they also show that in the movie for greater glory as well. The Mexican Constitution gave the government the power to license a limited amount of priests so the church would die. So they would say that the only way that a priest could be a priest is they had to report to the government and receive a license, kind of like a business license or something. But they limited like one priest for like, in some cases, like a hundred thousand Catholics, which that one priest could not minister to all the people that needed, needed sacraments and needed counsel. Many Mexican born uh, priests were imprisoned, beaten or executed for simply saying mass. Right south of our border, right in Mexico. This is her horrific history. A priest in Mexico could be executed if he did not register with the government. The government seized churches, schools, and closed them down and forbidden religious education in Mexico by the Catholic Church in order to de-Catholicize Mexico. Churches were desecrated by the federal soldiers. Statues were smashed. Holy vessels uh, were used to drink alcohol, and church altars were used for drunken parties. And here's an example of what the federal anti-Catholic army did with a federal general here at the table. They went inside a Catholic church and actually used the altar to uh, mock the Catholic church. They would have uh, someone go up to the pulpit and mock the Catholic church, and they would use the holy vessels, the chalices, to drink alcohol and to celebrate and to mock the Catholic church inside Catholic churches. They would desecrate the Catholic churches, smash statues and holy images. They would burn them. During this time, even claiming the body of a victim and holding a funeral was considered an act of insubordination and was punishable under the law. So why did President Calles and the anti-Catholic uh, government of Mexico do this? It was for, the main reason was for total domination of the entire uh, country of Mexico. They wanted no competition whatsoever, complete totalitarianism. Uh, the government seized all the industries. Calles was very wealthy, so Mexico was ruled by a wealthy fascist uh, nationalistic party in Mexico. They saw the faithful people as uh, competition, the Catholic Church's competition. The church had no problem with the government. The church made every effort to live peacefully with the government. The church did not want to be the government. They wanted the government to do the, the public services and the government just or the and the church to just help save souls and minister to souls. That's all the Catholic Church wanted was just to be able to exercise religious freedom. Engaging in secret worship, 
hiding a priest, keeping the Blessed Sacrament, preserving holy images, saying Viva Cristo Rey, and even pleading the life of someone to stop an execution were all punishable acts under the law. Several priests and Knights of Columbus were canonized by Pope John Paul II, including Father Rodrigo Aguilar Aleman, who sacrificed his life to protect the identity of seminarians. The anti-Catholic government would go and hunt seminarians and priests in order to either imprison or execute them. Father Luis Batiste Science was put before a firing squad for refusing to submit to the anti-religious laws of the 1917 Mexican Constitution. Father Mateo Correa Magalas was executing for simply refusing to break the seal of confession. They would torture a priest to make him reveal what they heard in confession, and if the priest did not reveal the secret of confession or the seal of confession, the priest was executed. Father Miguel Correa was shot for signing a letter which simply spoke out against the anti-religious laws. One thing that the Catholic laity and the church did is have like over two million signatures brought to the government uh, of Mexico, the Congress, to see if they could amend the Mexican Constitution to allow for religious freedom, and that was completely ignored. Even the over two million Mexican uh, citizens signed the petition. Father Pedro de Jesus Maldonado Lucero was beaten and executed for simply administering sacraments. Another priest, Father Maria Robles Hurtado, was captured while preparing to say mass and was killed the next morning. Only five priests that we know of actually bore arms against the state. One of those priests goes by the name of Father Jose Reyes Vega, who is featured in the movie For Greater Glory. He became one of the most successful generals in the Cristero War. Here's a picture of Father Vega meeting General Gorostieta right here. And here's another picture of Father uh, Vega right here, mounting his horse. He was known as Pancho Villa in a cassock. He was such a, a great military leader. Father Vega was the most famous and most controversial general. Known as Pancho Villa in a cassock, he was the toughest of soldiers, tough. Born in Tuxpan, Jalisco, of Indian parents, Father Vega spoke Nahutal, the language of the Aztecs. As you can see right here, um, here's a, another picture of the Cristeros right here. Notice how they're, they're Indian. They're Indian Catholic Cristeros who had a strong devotion to Christ our King and Our Lady of Guadalupe. They were willing to sacrifice their lives to practice their faith. Uh, Father Vega stood out as a leader in the seminary, winning the admiration of his classmates as a horseman and a chess player. Here's a picture of uh, Father Vega actually playing chess against Father Pedro Pedroza. This was another Catholic priest that was a, a general in the Cristero army, but Father Pedroza was known as the pure one for his impeccable morality. One thing about the Cristeros is there was impeccable Catholic morality in the army because they wanted to practice their faith. They were merciful towards captured uh, federal soldiers, for example where the federal soldiers, if they captured a Cristero, they would torture and execute them. As a Cristero soldier, Vega was said to have a Pancho Villa military genius, which won the loyalty of his troops, despite what some may think was unpriestly behavior by him taking up arms. Officers of the Cristero army were elected by their men, 
it didn't hurt Father Vega's chances or standing when his siblings were just as tough as he was. He came from a tough family. His brothers fought alongside him. Two of his brothers fought along his side, and his sister was part of the underground women's brigade, which I will tell you about later, uh, led by uh, Maria Goyez, who was a leader of the women's brigade in Mexico. Uh, Father Vega's mother actually carried a dagger with her at all times. On April 19, 1927, Father Vega and his soldiers attacked a train. And here's a picture of the train that they had attacked. And that was featured in our late, in, um, for greater glory as well. But he attacked this train that was transporting a large amount of cash. A large force of soldiers opened fire on the train that carried federal soldiers and some civilians. The Cristeros overwhelmed the military escort, killing about 150 people. But unfortunately, there were 50 civilians on the train that lost their lives. This was very controversial. This was used by the federal government to uh, defame the Cristeros. Uh, the Cristeros overwhelmed the military escort, and the anti-clerical Mexican government tried to use this to discredit and defame the Cristeros. The world press, however, picked up on this story, and then a war of words broke out in the news with both sides accusing the other of atrocities. The anti-religious government of Mexico used this attack saying that this clerical gang was, was typical of the methods used by the Catholic Church ever since the Inquisition. So they kind of used that to try to sway public opinion, but it didn't work. Why? Because this was refuted as fake news when the New York Times confirmed that the federal uh, soldiers actually used the civilians in the train as human shields and entered the passenger cars and staged their defense from the train, which resulted in the civilian deaths. So it was actually the fault of the federal soldiers, not the Cristeros. Father Jose Vegas Rea, uh, Vega continued to fight with his gun for the next two years, and his most famous action was the Battle of Tepetilan in Jalisco, Mexico, two years after the train attack. Six regiments of federal soldiers had been advancing across the state in three columns, the center which numbered about 2,500 troops. General Vega, who only had three regiments, decided to lure the federal anti-Catholic troops into a trap. He positioned about 70 of his men on top of tall buildings and church towers in the town and led over 50 more of his troops to positions of hiding a few miles from the town. So when, when they attacked the federal troops, if they fled, there would be uh, Cristeros along the way in positions to pick them off as they tried to escape. As soon as the federal troops entered the town, they were attacked by Vegas snipers, and before they could stop, stop the snipers, they found themselves under attack from more rebels who seemed to have appeared from no, nowhere. The federal troops fled from the town, but as they did, they were ambushed by Vegas cavalry who was hidden along the road. If the Cristeros had not run out of ammunition, the federal soldiers would have been totally wiped out. That's the only thing that saved some of the federal soldiers. That was one of the handicaps of the Cristeros is they had a limited amount of ammunition during the war. So a Cristero soldier was only given 20 rounds of ammunition, whereas a federal soldier had a virtually unlimited supply. So they would allocate like 250 rounds of ammunition for each federal soldier. Some 225 of the federal enemy were killed that day, but the rebels suffered a significant setback as well. Father Jose Regis Vega was mortally shot by federal soldiers who had been cut off in the re retreat. So unfortunately, 
he was shot. Um, he survived briefly. Um, he was taken um, to his deathbed. And on his deathbed, Father Vega was reconciled to the Catholic Church. He had been forbidden from his bishop from engaging in warfare, from taking up arms, but he ignored that admonition from the, from the bishop. So he made a con general confession to a local parish priest that was found and brought to him, and he made peace uh, and was reconciled in his, priestly, uh, in his priesthood. Um, he passed away and was buried at the parish church in Arandas. Cristero sympathizers remember Father Vega as a hero, as a Cristero hero, who sacrificed him his life for religious freedom. One of Vega's lifelong defenders was a fellow Cristero, Heriberto Navarrete, who said this about Father Vega years later. Here's a quote from one of Father Vega's uh, friends. Quote, no matter how great his faults, it is certain no one can doubt the rectitude of his intentions in the undertakings he carried out. Father Vega ignored the directive from his church that priests should never pick up a gun, no matter how horrific the injustice being faced. See, the church is uh, nonviolent, um, a pacifist. Like, the church allows martyrdom, okay? Like Jesus says, if you live by the sword, you, sword by, you die by the sword. So the church is always passive. Only in, in an absolute necessity for survival is uh, armed conflict permissible under the just war theory. So uh, the church always, it never endorsed officially, Rome never officially endorsed uh, the freedom fighters in Mexico to my knowledge. However, Vega's admirers, those who admired Father Vega, defended his decision to take up arms despite the orders of his archbishop. In three years of the First Cristero War, listen to this, about 90,000 combatants died, including 12 federal generals, 70 colonels, 1,800 officers, and over 40,000 federal soldiers and just about as many Cristero soldiers lost their lives as well. Uh, there was a lot of Cristero casualties before General Gorostieta took command of the Cristeros. They improved their ta tactics as the war went along. The Cristero rebe rebellion um, attracted truly moral and religious men. Uh, the other priest I mentioned earlier was a Cristero commander, was Father Aristo Pedrosa, named the Pure One. And here's a picture of him playing chess with Father Vega, the Pure One. Um, here's a quote from a Cristero General Aceveda, so you can get a, uh, a glimpse of what was the mindset of the Cristeros. Here's the mindset of the Cristeros as spoken by Cristero General Acevedo, quote, Our movement is in defense of the apostolic Roman Catholic Church, and we treat our people as Catholics and citizens of this nation. Our leader is Christ the King, and therefore this is an orderly movement that includes all those who never took part in previous revolutions and are now ready to take on the world. In our ranks are soldiers from previous wars, but they obey the new order and set aside their old grudges and personal hatreds like any soldier of Christ. Cristero General Justo Avila, a former officer under Pancho Villa, showed a great transformation, a conversion, when he joined the Cristeros. Avila and his troops had been terrible marauders under Pancho Villa. They were killers and rapists, but during the first Cristiata, he reformed his ways as a commander of the Cristero Guadalupe Regiment. That type of behavior was not tolerated by the Cristero leadership. 
Avila prohibited the slightest theft and banned women from living with his troops and prohibited his soldiers from having any woman other than their legitimate wives. The morals of the Cristeros was much more than ideological. Their morals were based on living a, a Catholic Christian life. Cristero's leaders restrained its soldiers from gambling, drinking, and public celebration due to a general concern of the army being vulnerable to ambush. Drinking and gambling was punished severely. The Cristero leaders understood that where there is music, there is wine, and the enemy can surprise us drunk. The Cristeros were spiritual warriors and died for Christ. Now let me talk to you about the women. A major a role in the Cristero wars were the women, were the Mexican faithful women. In 1926, after the Calles Law was implemented, and the churches were closed, it was the faithful Catholic women who were the most determined to stand guard over the churches, brave women. Catholic women encouraged their husbands and men to be courageous and fight for religious freedom in Mexico. A woman would tell a man he was not a man if he accepted such atrocities being committed against the faith without retaliation. Prodded by their wives, mothers, and sisters, Mexican men left to join the Cristeros. On June 21, 1927, when the Cristero military was growing, women's involvement contributed a vital role in supplying the Cristero army with ammunition and supplies. The first Joan of Arc's Joan of Arc Women's Brigade was formed in total secrecy and remained so throughout the war, which is completely amazing. They didn't have any defectors. The Women's Brigade was a military group organized in regiments of 650 women, complete with the ranks of general, colonels, majors, captains, etc. The groups were organized to obtain funds and provide supplies, ammunition, intelligence, shelter, and medical assistance to the Cristero soldiers. The brigade was named after St. Joan of Arc, who was canonized in 1920. Members took an oath of secrecy and proved to be very effective. The brigade consisted of young unmarried women between the ages of 15 and 25, and the leaders were no older than 30 years old. Beautiful young women. Um, here's a picture of Maria Goyes, who was the leader of the Women's Brigade. And then also here's a picture of Amparo Morales, who was also part of the Women's Brigade. And another picture here of Catalina de la Perea, I believe. Okay, so there's three of the uh, women's brigade with the leader, Maria Goyez, courageous women. Supplies were obtained. How did they get the supplies and the ammunition? Well, they obtained them from the factories, military factories, and even from federal troops. They, um, they actually traded ammunition for food. A big part of the war was there was a shortage of food because this affected the farming in Mexico. So there was a, a shortage of food. Food was valuable. So if you're hungry, these, these federal troops were willing to trade their, their ammunition for food. The Cristeros actually fired ammunition, newer ammunition made in 1927 and 1929, while the federal troops uh, used older ammunition made in 1925 and 26. When the Cristeros could not get to the villages to pick up the ammunition, the women would bring it to them by transporting it in special vestments worn underneath their dresses. And you'll see in the movie For Greater Glory, the women's brigade, there's a couple characters in the movie. These vests could hold five to 700 cartridges. Um, with these heavy loads of ammo, the women would ride the trains in order to deliver it. 
the Joan of Arc's Women's Brigade even taught the Cristero Army how to manufacture explosives, blow up trains and handle batteries and detonators. Very intelligent women. They trained the Cristero soldiers. The combination of secrecy and skill allowed the Women's Brigade to operate at 25,000 members without one single case of a recorded defection. Absolutely amazing. The federal government weren't even aware that there was a women's brigade, uh, not until 1929. Very little is written due to the secrecy. So very little is written or documented about the Joan of Arc Women's Brigade due to this uh, vow of secrecy. During the three years of the first bloody war, these women risked their lives and were jailed or even raped if caught and a few lost their lives for Christ. Please let me uh, honor another uh, faithful Mexican woman um, by the name of, she's a Mexican martyr, by the name of Maria del Carmen Robles, known as Carmelita. This is one of the only pictures of her. There's uh, Carmelita right there. And these were, she had a little uh, group of uh, nuns she formed a little women's group of nuns in Mexico. Maria del Carmen Robles Carmelita. Here's her story, tragic story. Her martyrdom, Maria del Carmen Robles Carmelita, her martyrdom earned her the reputation of being a saint. Carmelita founded the Daughters of Mary, a small community of 15 women featured right here. Uh, the youngest was 15 and the oldest was a widow of 65 years old. They were just holy, prayerful women. They were nuns. These holy women lived a, a religious life. That was part of the brutal crackdown on the church that the federal government would attack uh, the, the nuns and the convents, shut them down. And if they were foreign born, they would uh, deport them out of the country and, and completely uh, take all of their property from them. Um, Carmelita uh, engaged the general. There was a general by the name of Juan Batita, Batista Vargas. Um, Carmelita was a young and brilliant woman who actually challenged a federal general to a debate. And the general was Juan Batista, Batista Vargas. Juan Batista Vargas. So they had a debate and Carmelita uh, won the debate. They debated about the religion, the revolution, and the state. So the general was really mad that he lost this debate to this brilliant nun. Um, she won the debate, Carmelita, but her zeal and her determination in winning the debate proved to be fatal. After losing the debate from Carmelita, the general kidnapped her and raped some of her women. Carmelita disappeared. We, don't, we didn't know for years what happened to poor Carmelita. She disappeared. And some of her women were raped and met horrible, horrible fates. They completely desecrated these poor, holy, pure women. A victim who would, was interviewed years later um, said she was forced to stay as the wife of one of the soldiers. So the women were cap kidnapped and forced to be wives and uh, that's all we really know about what happened to the other woman. Um, Forty years later, the body of Carmelita Robles was found. Uh, she, her, her remains were found in a house that was scheduled to be demolished by, by a miracle. They found her remains. Uh, Maria del Carmen Robles Carmelita was solemnly buried, so may she rest in peace. Viva Cristo Rey. Please join me in the next segment uh, dedicated to St. Toribio. Viva Cristo Rey. Thank you.